This is ArtSense, a podcast focused on educating and informing listeners about the past, present, and future of art. I'm Craig Gould. First up this week is my conversation with journalist and author Barnaby Phillips regarding his new book, Loot, written in the Benin Bronzes, which details events in 1897 that led to the British looting of Benin Empire treasures and the complicated status of these objects that have since been distributed worldwide. In segment two, I speak to contemporary artist Huey O'Donoghue about his body of work in his most recent exhibit titled Night Cargo. O'Donoghue, a member of Britain's Royal Academy, is widely collected by museums in the United Kingdom and Ireland, including the British Museum and the National Gallery, where he previously served as the artist in residence. At the end of the episode, I'll be wrapping things up with some of the week's top art headlines. But first up, the scattered treasures of the Benin Empire. Thank you for joining us to talk about what is a, a lively topic today. Barnaby, you have recently published a book called Loot, Britain and the Benin Bronzes. I find the subject fascinating. Can you give us a little bit of a background about your book? Uh, absolutely, yes. The, the Benin Bronzes are treasures which come from the West African kingdom of Benin, uh, uh, an ancient kingdom which is today in modern uh, modern southern Nigeria. It was a kingdom which flourished uh, for hundreds of years. Perhaps it reached the height of its power around the 15th and 16th century, uh, which is when uh, Portuguese traders and explorers who were working their way down the West African coast first came into contact with it. Uh, There the followed hundreds of years of interactions with various uh, European powers, the Portuguese principally, but also the Dutch, the French, and then the British, who were the, the leading imperial power on, on the, that part of the West African coast by the late 19th century. Um, at which point uh, relations between the Benin Kingdom uh, and the British, which had been uh, rather good, started to go sour. Um, Britain was increasingly looking for more sources of palm oil, um, which lubricated the machines of the Industrial Revolution. It was also interested in rubber. And it came to see uh, the kingdom of Benin and its its king, who was known as the Oba, uh, as an obstacle uh, to trade. Uh, to cut a long story short, in, mm-hmm. in early 1897, a British delegation was on its way to uh, Benin, and it was stopped by uh, soldiers of the Oba um, and a handful of British uh, officials and traders were killed, uh, and in response, the British launched a punitive expedition. Um, over 1,000 soldiers and sailors were mobilized very quickly uh, from different parts of the British Empire, uh, and they took over uh, the the Benin Kingdom and incorporated it into the British Empire and exiled the Oba. And then, rather incidentally, uh, they stumbled across uh, these great artistic treasures which are bronze and brass castings, uh, but also ivory carvings, which were uh, looted en masse uh, and taken back to Britain in early 1897. And these are the objects uh, that we today call the Benin Bronzes. And this is the story I tell uh, in my book, who made them, how they were made, how and why the British came to take them, what has happened to them over the 120 odd years since, and then culminating, of course, in the very current debate uh, of whether we should give these objects back. So really, it's it's a story in three parts. One, the rich cultural history of uh, the Edo people uh, over a 500 year period, where what created so much interest in this artwork once it was revealed to the Western world was how exceptional the work was. And and so it seemed like it was a a bit of a cultural surprise in face of a traditional narrative that the people of this continent were savage, less refined people. 
but here they are creating this highly refined art. For example, the uh, pendant mask that's on the cover of your book is just exceptional. It's from, from the 1500s. Uh, the the carved ivory. You know, there was a period of 500 years where they're they're trading peacefully with the Portuguese. And then there is this period in 1897 where everything sort of comes to a head with the British. And then there's the plundering, for lack of a better word. That's that's absolutely right, Greg. Yes. Going back to the massacre uh, in January of 1897, I've seen reports where what may have been an exploratory or a party of porters and uh, assistance with the, these couple of British officers may have actually been the disguise for a party that was actually intending on ousting the Oba. And it may not have been as much of a massacre as a preemptive protection on the part of the Edo people. Have you explored that, whether that party that was massacred was actually intending on attacking the Edo people? Yes, I, I, I explore the, the context of what happened in, in 1897. It, it's complicated and there's still um, an element of mystery to it. I, I think to understand what happened during what, what the British came to call the Benin Massacre, uh, you need to go back a, a few years uh, to 1892. That is when an earlier British delegation uh, convinced uh, the, the, the Oba of Benin, or maybe they coerce him, maybe they trick him, it's not entirely clear, um, to sign a treaty which effectively uh, gives away his sovereignty, and if you like, that gives the British the, the pretext um, to then take further measures against the Oba. By 1897 as well, I think that the Oba has seen uh, that the British deal pretty ruthlessly with other kings in the Niger Delta coastal region uh, who, who do not, well, I suppose, uh, effectively bow down to the British, who get in the way of, of British sovereignty and British commercial interests. So they've seen uh, that the British have Maxim guns, they have artillery, and they're prepared to use it. So there is a heightened atmosphere of fear and anticipation within the Edo Kingdom. The specific motives uh, of uh, the vice consul, who was called James Phillips, who I'm not related to, when he sets off for Benin City in January 1897, are, I believe, still a mystery. He's not armed, but he is an ambitious colonial official. And in my mind, I think he's hoping one of two things will happen uh, to him. The first is that he'll perhaps be turned away peacefully. He's already been warned not to attend uh, because there's a sacred festival going on in, in Benin City. Uh, and that will then give him the pretext and the justification for a subsequent armed invasion, uh, which he has already been pushing for, uh, but his masters here in Whitehall in London are, are reluctant because of the expense um, and also the risks of fever if you send a large number of uh, white men into that part of West Africa at a time when people still don't know the origins and the causes of, of malaria. Mm -hmm. The second possibility, of course, is that he will be accepted by the Oba, uh, and the Oba will, if, if you like, bow down to the 1892 treaty. In either case, Phillips's career would have been done no harm. In fact, the third alternative, which he had not anticipated, uh, was that he is intercepted by soldiers of the Oba, who incidentally may not have been operating under the Oba's orders. There is considerable confusion and fear in the Benin Kingdom, and there are several powerful chiefs with different agendas at that time. Uh, but the third alternative uh, occurs, which is that Phillips uh, and several of his companions and many of the African porters are massacred, at which point... A British government, which has hitherto been reluctant uh, to go to the expense and trouble of sending a punitive expedition, feels that such has been the affront to its sovereignty, not least, of course, at a time of intense jealousy with other European powers, France and Germany, jostling for positions on the West African coast. They feel compelled to act. So I hope that clarifies a rather mm. tangled situation. Well, it, it is tangled and it is complex. But but regardless, it it leads to this this boiling point, which is the the punitive expedition. And 
that expedition culminates in uh, these British forces reaching the Obas Palace. Maybe you can kind of paint the scene for what they find and what uh, culminates from there. Yes. So the, the 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 British march in. They are the imperial superpower of the age. They're able to assemble a force very quickly in a, in a, in only. It's only five weeks after James Phillips and his companions are killed that the British take over Benin City. They're armed with the Maxim gun, which is a a weapon that no African army of the time can hope to compete against, a rapid-firing machine gun, more than 10 bullets uh, a second, um, and they fight their way in. There has been a panicked atmosphere in Benin City uh, during those, those weeks. As, as I was saying, the atmosphere had already been tense before the attack on James Phillips, but after uh, the killing of Phillips and his companions, uh, it, is, it, it is inevitable, uh, the Edo people fear and know that a serious British attack is coming. Uh, and this leads to a spate of human sacrifice uh, in Benin City during those weeks. So the British encounter um, a, a grisly scene, basically. Uh, it seems that many of these sacrifices are panicked attempts uh, to um, to keep the invaders away, and they don't they don't succeed. In fact, they enable uh, the British uh, to justify the invasion of Benin if in if you like civilizational term, uh, mm. civilizational terms that they are you know bringing Christianity, that they are putting an end to barbaric practices, uh, that they are ending slavery. Of course, in the 18th century, the British had been great proponents of slavery um, from West Africa. Uh, by the early and mid 19th century, they're zealously opposed to it. Um, and so th this is the context in which the British um, force their way into Benin City. Uh, and this is when they come across uh, the, the Benin bronzes, uh, which are mainly treasures which have been used to decorate the palace of the Obe himself. The mm -hmm. bronze casters of Benin are, are an exclusive guild who who work solely for the Obe, and they have worked for the Obe and his ancestors uh, for many hundreds of years. But in 1897, the Obe is deposed, he is sent into exile, he dies in exile uh, in 1914. He never sees his kingdom again. When they get to the palace... The palace is um, it's held up by a number of pillars, and covering the pillars were what uh, I think is the most popular of the Benin bronzes, which are these brass plaques that depict different scenes from uh, Edo life. They remove all the plaques. There are figures, busts, masks, bronze, and ivory. All of that collective work is basically sent back to the British Museum. Do, do I have that right, give or take? Well, to be to be precise, the British take over uh, Benin City on February the 18th. Uh, they burn down a series of um, chieftains' houses and, and, and minor palaces um, in subsequent days. But the, the great fire of Benin, which sweeps through a lot of the palace, is, is a couple of days later. It's on February the 21st. Um, and uh, there's fairly strong evidence that the British did not start that fire. But that, that's, I mean, that, that, that's a, a, a mere a detail that historians quibble over. You're absolutely right that the plaques, um, roughly the size of an A3 sheet of paper, if, if you know what that means, mm -hmm. um, each containing superb detail, these are amongst the prized possessions. It is thought that Traditionally, they would have decorated the pillars, although it seems that at the time that the British arrived, they were not on the pillars. But you're, you're absolutely right. The palace is looted willy-nilly. Of these hundreds of plaques, um, of these hundreds of um, ceremonial altars for previous uh, uh, for deceased obbers, so that involves lots of magnificent uh, brass and bronze heads, carved ivory tusks and all the rest of it, um, there was something of a, perhaps not, a, a free fall might be going too far, but the loot is, is carved up primarily amongst the senior officers that they get the best bits and the best pick. But there is a sense as well that some parts should be kept, uh, some prize parts are kept as gifts for Queen Victoria herself, uh, and some parts are given to the, the, the Foreign Office, um, the British Government Department. Um, 
and it is it is largely out of those that uh, a, a couple of hundred plaques uh, are given to the British Museum, um, and they go on they go on display in the British Museum in autumn of 1897. And and you're right, what you're alluding to earlier, when they go on display, there's a special exhibition, and it causes a sensation because the, many of these objects are so wonderful, they're so splendid. People are saying, "Oh, oh my God, this is like ancient Greece. This is like." Uh, Renaissance Italy, uh, and yet these people were meant to be barbarians. How can this be? And these people are meant to have no history, but here they are uh, in some of these plaques uh, depicting Portuguese soldiers in, in medieval armor from the 15th century in great detail. So it it, it seems self-evident that some of the plaques are, are several hundred years old. So that is, is a challenge, I suppose, for, for people who come to the museum and, and for curators, but the majority of, of Benin bronzes have been carted off, as I've said, um, as private property, typically of senior soldiers and sailors. Some of them keep retain their collections for many, many decades. And indeed, indeed, there are families in Britain who are direct descendants who still have uh, Benin loot from 1897. Many of them go on auction. And in fact, some of them go on auction very, very quickly. In the summer of 1897, Benin bronzes are going on auction in in London uh, as um, officers uh, seek to make a, a quick buck, if you like, um, out, out, of, out of their booty. So I guess we can fast forward to today in the question of what is right and what is the, the temperature for restoring and restituting these works to the Edo people within the nation of Nigeria? Well, it, it's an enormously complex issue. But I, I think what would be fair to say is that the Benin bronzes have become emblematic of this, what has become a, a very highly charged debate over colonial looted art. And, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. I think it's because in part, because the best of them are, are so magnificent, and there are so many of them, and they're so prominent in many of the great museums of the Western world, from the British Museum here in London, which has the largest collection, to the Met, to the Chicago Field, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, uh, Berlin, uh, the Musée uh, K. Branly in, in, in Paris, in Amsterdam, in Stockholm. All of these cities have fabulous collections of, of Ben and Bronzes. And I think the other reason why they seem to be at the center of the debate is because you know, 1897 is just not that long ago. It's right at the very end of the period of imperial expansion. Expansion, um, And I think many people feel that the circumstances in which they're taken were, were, were particularly egregious and very well documented from the British side in, in letters, in journals, and indeed in photographs. And all of that seems to contribute to the, the emotive power I, I suppose, that the Benin bronzes have. If you throw in as well the fact that the, the Benin kingdom, although, of course, it's been, you know, it's, it's part of the, the sovereign, modern sovereign state of Nigeria, but in some ways the Benin kingdom is is pretty intact. The the Obership was restored uh, by the British in, in 1914. Um, he's much more of a figurehead from then on. Uh, but there is still an Oba of Benin today. In fact, he is the great great grandson of Oba of Evralwem, who was overthrown in 1897, and he sits in a palace on on the same, more or less, on on the, on the same spot. Um, and the Edo people, as an ethnicity, as a language, as a, as a culture, notwithstanding the damage that was done to their material culture in 1897, are. Are, are still there. So I think that all has contributed to the, I suppose, the strength of their case. And I feel like this is a topic that has really bubbled up in the last year. In it seems like there's been a groundswell, and I don't know if that relates to the, the debate regarding other problematic statuaries or just a shifting cultural opinion on these types of topics. But we're, we're seeing governments in other countries beginning to consider and start the process of restitution. But what, what is the temperature like in Britain? Well, so I think if, if we go back a couple of years to 2017, the French president, Emmanuel Macron, went to West Africa and he made a pretty extraordinary speech in which he said it was no longer acceptable that 
that so much African heritage uh, was in was in European museums, and that had to change. And, and he commissioned a report, which came out a year later, which was much more radical than people had expected. And although it only pertained, or it specifically pertained to French museums, it put other European museums, including in Britain, uh, under great pressure. I think then you have to jump forward to 2020, um, and the explosion of feeling around Black Lives Matter, which of course started over there in the United States, but which took different forms uh, in different parts of the world. And I think, whereas perhaps in America, it, it, you know, inevitably, um, it was particularly focused on, on police brutality and, and a history of slavery. In Europe and indeed in Britain, it tended to focus particularly on the legacy of the colonial period and the legacy of, uh, of, the, of the imperial period. And that put institutions like the British Museum under great pressure. You ask what the temperature is in Britain. I, I think it's difficult to generalize about British, about different British museums mm-hmm. because they are, each one has their own guidelines, their own constitution, if you like. So there, there have already been some smaller museums, local authority museums, university museums, uh, which have indicated that they're willing, in fact, they want to return their, their Ben and Bronzes. But then if we talk about the British Museum itself, with a, with a capital B and a capital M, the, the huge institution um, in, in, in the middle of London that you might be familiar with, which is um, a, a national collection, and that is that is more constrained. Well, it's politically constrained in a way that smaller museums aren't, because we have something in the UK called the the British Museum Act of 1963, right. and and to, to put it simply, it would the government would have to change the law for the British Museum to permanently return objects in its collection. It's indicated that it wishes to. Uh, it's ready to lend back Ben and Bronzes, but to permanently return parts of its collection, and just to put it in context, it has almost 1,000 Ben and Bronzes, the biggest collection in the world, and what, you know, museum curators don't like it when one talks in these terms, but what lay people such as you and I may consider the finest and most beautiful, of many of the finest and most beautiful objects, uh, for them to... To, for, for there to be restitution from the British Museum, the law would have to change. And then sure. you look at the political context. We, we have a, a conservative government with a, with a capital C in the UK, um, and there's no indication with its majority in Parliament that this is part of its current political agenda to change that law. Right. Well, I, I was reading about uh, that law last night. I saw that in 2005, a high court ruled that the British Museum could not return Nazi looted work of old masters to their original homes in continental Europe. Right. So, so, fa- so the law has been changed now in the UK for Nazi for uh, for Nazi um, for loot taken during the Nazi period, and the law has been changed as well. Uh, for human body remains and body parts, which are in the British Museum. So proponents of restitution would argue, look, the law can change. Laws aren't stuck there forever. You know, as morality and ethics change, laws have to change with them. And what is the difference between, uh, you know, what was looted in the Nazi period and what was looted in 1897? You know, they're, they're fairly close to, well, of course, there are differences um, in specifics, but they're fairly close to each other in terms of time, uh, and that's where you find institutions like the British Museum on, on rather on on the back foot. So I, I guess an, another counter that I hear some people that are are for keeping the work in Britain is that more people can see them in London, and they would not be as safe if they returned to Nigeria. What would you say about that? Well, the fir- well, the first part is definitely true. There are six million visitors. Um, a year to the to the British Museum, or at least there were before this this terrible pandemic, which we hope we'll all emerge from. Um, and it, no Nigerian museum could hope to could, could could hope to attract that many visitors. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I suppose this is also an argument about morality and ethics uh, and a people's culture. And also, I think we 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 have to appreciate that the the Oba of Benin, um, indeed his father, many prominent uh, Edo people, uh, are asking effectively for a, for a historical wrong 
to be recognized, for the principle that these objects belong to them uh, to be acknowledged, for many of them to come home. But I don't think anyone is actually thinking that every Benin bronze uh, in the world should go back to Nigeria or, or, in, or indeed that they should. I think we all want to live in a world where we are enriched by uh, other cultures that we can enjoy um, and see uh, other cultures. And one of the great things about the Benin Bronze is, in fact, is that, as I was saying, there, there are thousands of them. So mm. we ought to be able to reach a situation uh, in which uh, you, you know, the wrongs of the past are acknowledged, um, uh, there can be substantial restitution, and yet the great collections of the world can still display uh, parts of our, our great uh, global shared heritage. I, I would say uh, as well, actually, the, the situation is, is fairly complex now. If you talk to some of the people who are trying to set up a new museum in in Nigeria to host uh, uh, returning Benin bronzes, you know, the, there are quite a few museums in the German museums say, in principle, they're ready to return theirs. There are, there are museums in Britain which say they're ready to return theirs. Um, there's starting to be a, a, some museums in the United States which are saying they're, they're willing to return theirs or they're, they're, they're ready to consider and talk about that. I'm not so sure that the issue will necessarily be a shortage of Ben and Bronzes as they go back. I think we need to look more and more, in fact, at Nigerian politics um, and not so much indeed uh, at what's happening in, in Britain and in Berlin, because in Nigeria there are different groups that have vested interests in this return process. You have the, the Oba who's still there, who says, you know, these objects were, were, were stolen from him, that they should, they should he, he's agreed in principle to the idea of a museum, but ultimately, you know, he has to give consent uh, morally to, to any process of return. You have a local state government, the Edo state, um, and there are jealousies and rivalries uh, between the Oba and the governor in Edo state. And then you have a federal government of, of Nigeria, uh, which, you know, at times has difficult relationships with state governments. And so the, the Nigerians have an amazing opportunity. I, I really feel they're pushing against an open door. Um, but I, I, I was a BBC correspondent in Nigeria for several years. I know Nigeria well. And Nigerians themselves know that there are unfortunately no shortage of, of missed opportunities in, in their country's post-independence history. Uh, there is a golden opportunity to, to get it right. There is an enormous amount of international goodwill. Um, but I would say watch Nigerian politics as much as you uh, watch um, British or German politics as to what will happen next. Well, it's it's certainly a complex issue. It appears you have uh, written a book that is uh, enlightening on all fronts, and it appears to try to present the facts and shine a light on what's a, a very complex and murky issue. Certain things just can't be denied, which are the quality and uh, beauty of the work and its appeal around the world. How, how we resolve this issue, I guess, is, um, is yet to be seen, right? Uh, absolutely. And it, it, it is a story full of, full of, full of complexity. Um, and I try and tell it in, in all its nuance and it's all its complexity. There are, you know, some quite counterintuitive parts to this story. And, um, you know, the, the fact that one of the principal looters, um, a man called Neville was also an outspoken advocate of racial equality in, in Nigeria in the 1890s. Uh, the fact that British colonial uh, British colonial officials in the 1950s went to great lengths to try and buy back Benin bronzes in in, in auctions in London and bring them back to Nigeria's uh, nascent uh, museum uh, national museum system at the time. Um, the fact that if you spend time in Benin City, different people have very different perspectives. People don't always speak with one voice. And I try and do justice to all, all these different all these different points of view, and and hopefully let the, the reader themselves um, decide. I, I, don't, I don't I don't want to preach to them, but I do feel if if I can quote the words of the current governor of Edo State, a man called Godwin Abasaki, this is a this can be a win win situation. This can be something. Uh, which can end in in a positive way and with a reaffirmed sense of our 
of of common humanity coming out of a very very dark episode in in history. Well, Barnaby, I really appreciate you joining us today. Again, Barnaby Phillips, the book Loot Britain in the Benin Bronzes. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you. It was a great pleasure speaking with you, Craig. Thank you. Thank you. So, on weekends, some families like to go to baseball games. Some families like to go to the lake. But our family likes to go to museums. Surprise, right? And so this past Friday night, the family went out to dinner and then went to an art museum. A really spectacular art museum. Uh, There were Courbet's, Bonnard, Monet, Picasso, Mondrian, Kaibok, Munch, and I was the family's docent. And so we kind of split up, and my son and I went in one direction, and my wife and my daughter went another. And a couple of minutes later, my daughter comes and taps me on the arm and said, Dad, you have to come see this painting. I love it. And so I went around the corner, and there was this painting called The Geography Lesson by Louis Leopold Boilly. And she adored it. It was a scene of a father and a daughter in his study, along with the family dog, and he's giving her a geography lesson. And I asked my daughter, you know, why she found it so special. She really couldn't put her finger on it, but I think it had something to do with her seeing some of herself in the painting. The daughter in the the painting is roughly her age, and I think she can visualize her and her dog in our office, and she made a connection, which is awesome. By the end of the night, I paid three dollars for three postcards, three by four inch of the painting for her as a keepsake. When we got home, I was in the office. She came in and said, hey dad, do you think I can see that painting on the Cambia? And I was like, let's see. I pulled it up and there it was in full high definition, the geography lesson on our wall and she was delighted. The Cambia is a 17 by 28 inch digital art frame. Cambia's full HD display provides unmatched detail. The brush strokes, you can see every one. There's a technology called ArtSense, just like the name of this podcast, that samples the ambient light in the room and automatically adjusts the display to heighten the sensation that you're looking at a real painting or print. Unlike a framed TV, the goal of the Cambia is an authentic viewing experience. Your Cambia provides access to thousands of historic works, and premium members have access to a host of contemporary artworks as well. If you want to learn more about Cambia, head over to cambia.art and check it out. And now, a dive into the world of Huey O'Donoghue. So, uh, Huey O'Donoghue, I really appreciate you joining us today. For the person that's not aware of your artwork, how do, would you normally describe your work to the person that is approaching your paintings for the first time? Hi, Craig. Um, yes, that's always a difficult question because as the artist, you, you tend to be inside things um, and uh, you're preoccupied on, on, on what, you do, what you're doing at the time. But I think it'll be, if you look at what I've done over years, um, over many years now, I've been interested in the idea of, of, of the relevance, of the ongoing relevance of painting as an art form. Um, it's something that I've been uh, drawn to um, uh, from, the, from a very early age. And, um, and so a number of things were sort of key factors in my development. Um, one of them was was being a sort of uh, an artist in residence at the National Gallery in London, which was a kind of privileged position. In that, that was in the early eighties, um, but it 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 had a lasting effect in that I looked at the tradition of painting not as something that was to be um, ignored and um, you know replaced by something new, um, but something that could be learned from. And so uh, I, my my interest in painting was was fueled by that. Um, I wasn't 
necessarily interested in in ironizing it. And so, uh, but I also knew that I wanted to develop a, a personal particular style and I wanted my work to be relevant to the 20th, 20th century then, 21st century now. So my paintings, to, to get to the core of your question, are characterized by, they're, they're meant to be large, well, they're often large scale, overwhelming um, in size. Um, they're very physical. They they involve you in the actual material of paint of painting, so that um, a typical response might be that you see the paint first, and you see that an image later. That there's a sort of tension between the act of painting and what you are actually painting. So. Um, these paintings often deal with um, they deal with themes. Um, they hover between the two idioms of abstraction and figuration um, for for various reasons. And so, I mean, that's that's been a term that's been used to sort of describe my work often because it's not obvious. It's not graphic. It's very visceral. It's very painterly. And whatever medium I I work in. I try to exploit that medium to its to its maximum potential, so that the response from the viewer is first of all, um, it, it's compelling for them. It commands their attention, and secondly, um, they, they perhaps start to perceive what the layers of of meaning in it are. So I hope that goes some way to um, I can describe more uh, yeah. physically no yeah, that's but um, that's excellent so um you know I've, I've heard you speak on this notion of uh memory versus remembering maybe you could yeah. kind of help elucidate that concept as it yeah. pertains to your work well it's it, um uh, i suppose that um I, I got interested in memory for all sorts of reasons the two kind of obvious memories are personal memory which is usually not accurate. Um, I'd say it's often true, but not accurate. And then there's cultural memory. I mean, I've made pictures that have alluded to, say, the First or Second World War, which I wasn't alive to see, but they're part of cultural memory. And remembering, which I think is a more accurate term, if you think about remembering, it's almost like putting limbs on a body. So it, it involves an imaginative process um, of uh, of re reimagining, or actually, if you think about it, representing something, some uh, some response to an experience. You and so it is representational. It's representing something, and um, uh, I, I I had various roots into that, um, and I've. I've, I've um, uh, how should I say, ruminated on it over a, over a long period of time. And what I found is that things that really connect to me, I can successfully remember in some way. And I'm, what I'm looking for is not a description um, of something, but a, but um, something that stands in place mm. um, of the event. And so, um, so there's those two those two personal strands, and. In a way, it, another word would be consciousness. Um, often people think about remembering and memory as being to do with the past, but it's actually rooted in the present, firmly rooted in the present, in the sense of who we are. We all have these markers, which we, we construct our own sense of our own identity from, whether they're grandparents and stories from the past or places families lived in. And that's how we, we construct our sense of the present. The present is 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 always in your face in a sense. It's always there, and it's very very difficult to record it somehow without it being almost reportage. And the future is unknown, so all we have to some extent is memory. Um, and most of my paintings tend to deal with with r r things that have, that have affected my life, or um, but, but sometimes occasionally. A, a, an event happens that is so significant and so world affecting that I'm able to respond. And one of those events was the 9/11 in America, and um, the first real paintings I made in relation to that were about 2003, 
Um, uh, so that that was really quite a quick turnaround for me, but it was partly to do with it was such a sort of world world affecting event. Everybody knew about it. Everybody knew where they were. They changed the world, and so it it had an. But it, again, I didn't want to deal with it in terms of reportage. I wanted to allude to it through symbolism and uh, um, you know all the, the imagery that goes with it. Sure. So, so that that painting that I think you're you're speaking of specifically Tomb of the Diver, it's a yeah. it's a it's a very um, well you you're making historical reference to to a specific piece of art, but the the image the the colors are it's just something very visceral, and I think there there's also scale uh, you know at play there. But maybe you could tell us a little yeah. bit about that specific work. Yeah, well, uh, that is it's an enormous work. I think the one you're talking about is is sort of 16 feet tall, um, and it's made in three sort of vertical columns, and it roughly corresponds to the original design for the World Trade Center, the architect's drawing, um, in terms of its form, which placed the two columns in in uh, and, a, and in sort of an equidistant space between them. So that's where the painting gets its form. Um, the diver, obviously, the images of divers were, were associated with the, the terrible events of 9-11. And uh, people had various views about them. I always saw them in a quite a sort of positive way, that they were people not awaiting fate, but taking hold of their own destiny. Um, uh, but also, I was, I was affected by something I saw just after, which was a, a tomb in... Paestum in Italy that I didn't know about. It's about 480 BC, and it, it's about the tomb's occupant entering the afterlife. He dives into the, the un, what was then the unknown sea, which is the Atlantic, and um, you know the other end there's a, there's a pomegranate tree, which is a symbol of life. So it's about entering the afterlife. So there were a number of themes involved in that, including personal themes I picked up on the idea of the, of the unknown individual the divers um, I had somebody particular in mind but it could be anybody um, that this that that's always been a, something that fascinated me the the unknown um, the unknown person in history rather than the person who we're all told about is important uh, the the individual who's kind of lost and swept up in history and the, the painting, the color of the painting is this sort of amazing blue sky of New York on the day it happened. It's a kind of, it's a, a sort of, um, a sort of an intense visceral blue. And at the bottom of the painting, it's like a, it, people have looked at it casually and thought it was a volcano, but it's an image of the city of Casino in Italy where uh, my father fought in 1944. But it's, a, it's like a ruinous. Um, city like New York was, so it it has it's how you connect. How I'm trying to do it is connect with history through personal uh, reference, but also through universal references. And um, one one further point about that is that you know I think that that's one of the roles that painting can do. That it can one of the things it can do is that it it can tell a different story. It can tell a poetic story. And um, I've re- I've read a lot of history, um, mainly in, in connection with with researching subjects. But I've noticed you read different historians, you get very different um, versions of events. And um, so uh, the the poetic version of events can, can often be the truest record. Um, you know, the Victorian uh, the English Victorian critic said that really um, uh, that you know it's often the the book of a nation's art is the truest record of its of its deeds because the artist should have no no axe to grind, whereas the historian and the politician may may well have. So, so that's my take on that. And it was it was a yeah you know, it was a rich vein of um, of imagery that's been in my work. The idea of di- the diver being symbolic of somebody who's immersing themselves in a you know in a, in a sort of spiritual or a, or a an imaginative journey, you know, rather than it being literal, you know. Um, so I've, I've always tried to pitch my work so it, it allows the viewer 
their own kind of way in. Um, you know, there's not only one interpretation of it. And sometimes some of the more obvious interpretations that I haven't seen because I'm too close to the to the process mm-hmm. of, of making it. And that's something that, that a lot of people have pulled me up on about. But it's to do with how painting establishes meaning. It does it in a very different way to, to purist conceptual art, where the, the idea is there, you know, and that's the only thing that's important. In painting, an idea is modeled, it's, it's changed, it's transformed and enriched. And it, it, it only appears in when the, the, the form of the painting is resolved. It, it sounds like that's, that's pretty much a, a constant struggle with, with the artist, content versus form, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's the interesting bit of it. <laughs> right. You know, there's the idea and then there's the execution, right? Do you start with the idea or do you let the idea come to you? Well, I've got so much history now, I suppose, that ideas come and go and they get picked up again. But I think you hit the nail on the head there. It's content and form. And in, in abs- I, when I started out, I was a sort of formalist abstract painter because I was making paint. I was looking around at what was being done and that was the sort of, you know, I wanted to make relevant work. But eventually I, I, I felt the need of subject matter and that the, the that's, the, that's content, really, I suppose. And so the, the purpose of content is to measure what you're making your painting against. Mm-hmm. Um, to, have, to have something to refer back to. If you've only, if you're only got the painting itself, um, and I'm, I'm not decrying um, other artists who've done that, and it may, may work for them or whatever, but it, if it's only, you know, the form... My life would be a lot easier. I think if all I had to worry about was making be- things in a beautiful form. Right. Um, so the the subject, that kind of anchor point, is what is is the grit that makes the pearl in the oyster. And uh, uh, it's difficult and irritating, and you you have a subject and you don't quite know how to do it. But what what happens when it in a really good way sometimes is a light bulb flat comes on and you. You you realise you've been overcomplicated, putting too much in, and you, you you simplify things, and you find a for a new form because that's what you're trying to do as a painter. I suppose you're trying to make a painting that nobody else has made. If you're a serious painter, that's what you what your ambition is, right. um, and uh, you know to make something that's that's new and uh, hasn't been done before. Sure. So one of the previous podcast episodes kind of revolves around Andrew Wyeth and one of the uh, one of the persons I interview is Bo Bartlett who's an accomplished contemporary painter but he spent five years with Wyeth and worked mm-hmm. alongside of him and documented his work and one of the things that Bo said that Andrew Wyeth used to talk about a lot was this sense of place mm-hmm. right and being rooted in your patch of earth and letting those roots yeah. be your crown when I look at your work and hear you talk about your work, I, I feel like that same idea kind of ruminates with you. And so maybe, could yeah. you talk to a little bit about place and the importance of place? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that, that that's a very good analogy, I think, um, because I think in great pa- paintings of landscape, uh, they're, wherever they are, whoever's made them, there is that in a really strong sense of, of place and it's the difference between a lot of time an artist who knows somewhere absolutely in, in an intimate way they're not a tourist they're not gone there to, to paint the scenery but they they know the place um and they've lived that place in a sort of and somehow because they have that connectionship with the place they've earned the right to paint it mm. um in a way and um it's a it's a curious, really curious thing. Um, uh, for me, um, I suppose my um, in my work when I when I sort of start I moved from abstractions a long, long time ago, probably in 1980, I moved from abstraction. I got dissatisfied and I wanted to make paintings, and so I, I went back to what was the 
what were really very, very early memories of, of, of place. And they had a particular resonance because um, my mother emigrated to England from the west coast of Ireland, from County Mayo, and she, she did that in 1937. She didn't do it because she was... Um, wanting to see the world, she did it for economic necessity. She wanted to get a job, and so she she kind of almost spent the whole of her life being homesick. And she would take us back there um, as a child, and, so I, I, and it was kind of a magical place to go as a child because you they, you know you took your shoes off when you went and you know um, ran around the place, and it was it was a primal landscape. You collected water from the river, and you. You got turf for the fires, and it, yeah, it was very, it was an exciting place to be. And that, that, that early memory of that place was a, was an absolute engine because I, even though I wasn't at the time, I was making paintings in England. I was, I was, I was dredging up this idea of the landscape of memory, of the landscape of feeling, um, in these paintings, and so they were quite freely constructed. Um, and that's that's kind of interesting, actually, in in reference to what I've actually been doing um, during the lockdown in London, which is which you could categorise under the landscape of fact, which are images of Deptford Creek in London, which was near the studio where I was working, and it was a, it was a very sort of unusual because I was walking past this every day, and it it, it was there was something starkly unusual about London being depopulated, nobody being there. Um, so I made I made these images. So that was, but again, that's quite unusual in a way to connect with something as absolutely instantaneous as that. But that's something that I'm interested in. Those two landscape as fact, where it's just fact, um, and the landscape of memory, and uh, that's that's my preoccupation at the moment. But your your point about place is absolutely significant. It feels. Uh, however beautiful the place is, it wouldn't. It, I couldn't. I couldn't actually make work related to it unless I felt a, some kind of connect connectivity. Mm -hmm. And that's, I suppose, if you look at Cezanne's paintings of Mont Saint Victoire, they're amazing. You know, over fifty paintings. They don't tell you anything about Mont Saint Victoire really, but they tell you a lot about Cezanne. Um, you know, that it's it's his response to the landscape. And um, I see that as, as a sort of as a powerful thing. Like only connect, I forget whose expression that is, but that you've got to connect in some way, or I have at least to make a work of art. It's got to connect. Right. So your your most recent uh, body of work, Night Cargo, yeah. is it's beautiful. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you can uh, give us some really interesting background about it. I, I, I didn't know the whole backstory about the the uh, the film Nesratu um, right. and what it was trying to symbolize. And I'm curious if you pulled from that before the pandemic started, or was it um, a happenstance that those what was going on in the world was kind of aligning with some of the themes that were showing up in the paintings? Well, I, I think it, it, strangely enough. That on this occasion, the paintings really predate the pandemic. They look very prescient, um, but they um, they begin, I think, about 2014, 15. It was gradually developed. Um, Nosferatu, I think, is a master visual masterpiece of the 20th century. But again, it, it's something I knew I came across as a youngster, and. Uh, reluctantly watched it because I didn't have much interest in silent cinema, but it was fabulously visually compelling, and it was a truly terrifying story, really, because it. Um, but it, it, I, I can understand also it was kind of allegorical, and uh, to me, it, it, at the time I was studying the First World War, and and Murnau was a veteran of the First World War, and um, you know the idea for the vampire film came out of the First World War. Um, from some um, encounter with a sort of Serbian farmer who told him that his father had been a vampire, or he told the, one of the producers, um, um, Alvin Graub, I think, Graub, sorry, name it alludes me, but it, it has this, its rootedness in this trauma, and the film conveys that in a very sort of compelling visual way, 
And so um, the, the, they are large-scale paintings. They're sort of um, uh, 12 feet by sort of 24 feet in the case of cargo. And, of course, in the story, um, the cargo is... Um, is the plague um, that that comes back from uh, uh, from uh, the German little German town? Uh, the estate agent goes off to sell uh, the county's castle in London or whatever in the book. Uh, that was all changed in Murnau's film for copyright reasons, but the story is basically the same. And um, it comes uh, he comes back with his cargo of coffins, which are, which carry the plague, and so. It has all this kind of layered, layered meaning, and um, uh, I didn't know about the pandemic was going to was going to uh, come about or have any idea of that. So the paintings, but the paintings now it's very hard to look at them without that prism there. Um, so uh, it, it it was about that, but it's it's also about the. Um, the world of dreams, the um, the, the kind of um, kind of neo neo surrealism in a way that um, they put together slightly improbable things in a, in the way that dreams do, um, and and of course they these employ photographic space, um, mm-hmm. and they're on they're on industrial tarpaulin, um, which is a kind of sculptural um, thing. So they, they, although they're paintings, they're really employing two, two sort of almost alien space, the, the, the space of, of photographic space and with uh, the mm-hmm. sculptural space of the tarpaulin or the sacks that I've used in some of the other paintings. Um, and the, what the paint does is really pull it together, really, in a way. It has a very sort of modest role in the whole um, enterprise, but it, it actually... They are paintings, and um, and so they have this, um, yeah. And they, they're also meant to be like cinema. Um, it's hard to remember now, but when 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 I first went to cinema, it was kind of sh- visually shocking because they called it the sort of silver screen, and and you would go into this darkened space and see this amazing um, silvery version of reality and. Uh, uh, and I, was, I suppose that was some of the inspiration for those paintings, cinema and um, and also storytelling. You know, um, there's a there's an element of um, storytelling in my cultural background that that recurs in my painting. Um, there's an argument that storytelling is the heart of all art, but it's something I've not wanted to purge from my work. And it sometimes occurs in a very, in a very um, sort of uh, minimal way. In that the idea for the work on sax came from the, the fact that my grandfather really spent his whole life unloading sax um, in Manchester at the um, at the goods depot there. So it was a kind of, you know, it was a it was a kind of repurposed material as well, a re- reused material, and. I suppose that's at the heart of the project of what I've done is to try and reinvent paintings um, over the reinvent how I make paintings, so that people don't say, "Well, that's that's a Huey O'Donoghue painting. It looks like that." Well, it it may have looked like that in 2000, but it doesn't look like that in 2000. It's going to look different, um, and that that's what excites me. And I've got to retain that sort of excitement. I've got to want to see what the painting is going to look like. And it's got to be di- it's got to be different, but it's got to feel like me. Um, right. That's how I suppose I judge it. So tell me, you know, in, in my yeah. mind, um, yeah. a a great painting is great regardless of its size. You know, I've seen amazing small paintings. I've seen amazing enormous paintings. Yeah. But can you speak to me about yeah. scale as an attribute in your work? Yeah. Um, Yes, I, I agree totally. Um, uh, I make small paintings, and um, but um, I suppose it's it's also very much to do with the the space you're going to to show paintings in. And there's been a in recent years 
um, a sense of sort of breaking out of the traditional gallery space and the frames around paintings and um, and to try and engage with the space where those paintings are going to be shown. And um, I've always I've always found that challenge interesting, um, whether it's showing them in an old church or in a in a factory building somewhere or in a, in, a, in a grandiose museum or whatever. I've tried to tailor the work to to make you go into the space and that you you feel it's appropriate to be in the space that the work is there that 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 you 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 um, you engage with the architecture rather than fight with it, and uh, your um, so in a sense, I suppose the the thing about scale certainly I've been interested in the idea of, of surrounding the spectator like like the thin screen did, and so that they're not just looking into the painting, they're looking at it. And that attention that I've tried to have in my paintings, even if they're small, you know, you're not looking into them, you're looking at them, it's the object. And the, you know, the two, the two only two traditions that I, I can work out in, in, in Western painting, one is the painting as a window, that you're looking into a window, the other is the painting as an object, and I'm trying to fuse those two. So you, you've got a thing that you're looking at, and you, you've also got an image. So the scale has been something that's, that's excited me, that physicality of it. Um, and uh, I suppose it's just something that excited me when I was young. I thought, wow, that you can do painting that big. That's, that's extraordinary. And... Um, uh, but it doesn't mean I decry small work, and uh, it has its um, it has its place, um, uh, absolutely. But I think scale is, particularly in the modern world, is important. How how art is it, art's not shown in isolation; it lives in the space where it's shown. I've done a lot of site specific um, works, um, and that's made that's that's actually been a, a liberating factor. For me, you know, if somebody says, "Look, here we, we've got this this um, factory here that, um, you know, what can you do? Right. <laughs> what can you do in this?" It's, that's very very exciting because it carries with it all the baggage of the place. It's a bit like what you said earlier about uh, Andrew Ware's connection right. with his place. You know, this is a place you, you've already got a place that's a given, and um, so so that ex- excites me. And I, I did a lot of paintings of the human figure, um, starting probably in the early mid eighties. And I still make paintings of the human figure. And, but one of the things that is almost universal in those paintings is the human figure is always the same scale as a human being. It's, mm-hmm. it's always, you know, at least sort of six feet tall by, so that you're not, didn't, you're not diminishing it, so it's not becoming like a, um, you know, again, you're not looking into it, you're looking at it. Right. Um, and so uh, that's that's ex- excited me, really, scale um, in art, and it, it just gives you different, different possibilities. Certainly. Well, Huey, I really appreciate our time today. Do you currently have any work being exhibited or coming up? I do. I have a uh, an exhibition of new paintings, um, which will be shown in London in November at, at the Marlborough Gallery, um, which is not none of them which have been seen, um, either or in reproduction or anything. So that'll be a um, new show of work um, November this year. Another show in London in the spring at the 12th Star Gallery, which is a European EU gallery, um, which will be ma- mainly prints, um, but we have some paintings in them. And we have plans for shows in the following year, which I can't really say much about at the moment, but um, um, they will be um, happening, I think. And so I'm trying to make those shows. There will be there will be new work. It will be a move on from the, the night cargo work. Um, but that will get shown again. So um, at some point, 
Um, so. Great. And if, and if folks wanted yeah. to to keep track of you and your work, uh, do you have a website or? You know, a, we, we do have a website. I'm able to say for the first time in 20 years. Um, yes, we do have a website. I finally got organized on that, and it does have information about my work. And there was a very good uh, documentary made by RT Television, a half an hour documentary that was made by RT, which you can access on that website, um, which will give you a, a feel of the, the work, I think. And, and that was filmed in the Irish studio because I work in London and Ireland. Um, and um, that's partly to do with the history, my own history of being involved in those places. But... So that's on the website, and uh, yeah, there should be a good bit of information out there. But right. um, yeah, but any other inquiries can right. come through Marlborough or Southern, Southern Partners I'm working with at the moment. That was um, uh, Graham Southern of um, uh, it's Big Lane Southern, but it's Southern Partners now, and uh, we're working with them and Marlborough. So yeah, wonderful. Well, once again, I really appreciate your time, Huey. And uh, thank you for joining us. Well, it was great talking to you. It was great talking to you, Craig. And now, the news. It was recently announced that the world's northernmost modern art museum is planned to open in 2025 in the Siberian city of Nordlisk. Recognized as the world's most depressing city, the community of 180,000 residents is built around a nickel mining operation in the Arctic Circle. In addition to federal grants from Russia, mining company Nornickel is chipping in 150 billion rubles which is roughly $2 billion U.S., to convert an abandoned shopping mall into a new contemporary art space totaling roughly 91,000 square feet. But why is the location considered so depressing? Well, try rampant industrial pollution, virtually no sunlight all winter, and an average high temperature in February of 11 below zero Fahrenheit. Hopefully the new space will provide a warm respite in those long, dark winters. There is a hot new artist who is causing quite a stir in this new cycle. An artist with no formal training and no history of exhibiting their work, but whose upcoming show in New York is fetching prices between seventy-five dollars and $500,000. You might recognize his name, and in fact, that's the problem. This newly minted artist is Hunter Biden. Hunter, who has been accused of providing access to his father at the right price, will be showing his new work at the Georges Berges Gallery in Soho. There's been bipartisan questioning about whether the younger Biden is dragging his father into an ethics quagmire. The question at hand is what is keeping a Russian oligarch or some other interested foreign party from paying Hunter in exchange for some form of favoritism? We are being assured that there is what the business world calls a Chinese wall in place. In other words, certain information is not shared to avoid a conflict of interest. Supposedly, the purchase agreement with the gallery has been crafted in such a way that the buyer's identity is withheld from Biden. This discussion made it all the way to the White House press room this week, where White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki had to field questions about this arrangement. Can I have a question mm-hmm. on Hunter Biden's artwork? Mm-hmm. Did the White House play any role in crafting the sales agreement with the New York Gallery um, to protect the uh, the purchasers or the ultimate purchasers' identity? Well, I, I can tell you that after careful consideration, a system has been established that allows for Hunter Biden to work in his profession within reasonable safeguards. Uh, of course, he has the right to pursue an artistic career, just like any child of a president has the right to pursue a career. Uh, but all interactions regarding the selling of art and the setting of prices uh, will be handled by a professional gallerist adhering to the highest industry standards. And any offer out of the normal course would be rejected out of hand. And the gallerist will not share information about buyers or prospective buyers, including their identities with Hunter Biden or the administration, which provides quite a level of protection and transparency. The gallery owner is a private citizen who might not be privy to who might have some 
interests in purchasing this artwork. <coughs> is the White House doing anything to work with the owner to make sure um, there's not impropriety there when it is ultimately sold? Well, I think it would be challenging for an anonymous person who we don't know and Hunter Biden doesn't know to have influence. So that's a protection. Is it a protection? I guess. But there is nothing to stop the buyer from self-identifying themselves outside the bounds of the transaction. The buyer could pay $500,000 for an original Hunter Biden and upon receipt take a picture with the painting and email Hunter directly saying, hey, look, I'm the guy who paid half a million dollars for your painting. Maybe we can meet for coffee. The bottom line is what does someone think they're buying when they pay $500,000 for a Hunter Biden painting? That's all the time we have for this week. You've been listening to ArtSense. You can find the show on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe. And while you're there, please rate the show and leave a quick review. Your feedback is the key to other folks finding us. If you'd like to see images related to the conversation, read a transcript, and find other bonus features, you can go to cambia.art and click on the podcast tab. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can email me at craig at cambia.art. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.